thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Charles Kenny. I'm a senior fellow at the Centre for Global Development and delighted to be hosting this event, uh, I should say, with uh, Michael Jarvis of, of TAI. Um, uh, we're going to discuss today IDA and, and the role for civil society organisations um, and sort of the role for IDA with civil society organisations, if you will. Uh, 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 Vine uh, Bayava, uh, Chief Technical Advisor for the Partnership of Transparency. Hi, Vine, uh, is going to present um, a report that they've been working on um, and we'll talk for about 20 minutes. And then we have a fantastic set of panelists um, from whom I am hoping five to no more than 10 minutes each um, uh, uh, to talk. I'm afraid we one panelist is missing. Um, we'd hope that uh, uh, Floribert Ngaroku could join us, uh, who's the executive director for Africa Group One at the World Bank. He um, sadly was called home, um, but then kindly his alternate, uh, 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 Mr. Kibwe, said he would he would step in. But as you may know, it is um, uh, uh, the 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 Africa Leaders Forum this week in Washington, <clears throat> uh, and I think he was called away uh, to help with his president who is in town. So. <laughs> Nah. Uh, there we are. Um, um, I, I was talking to Vina just before, um, and he said that they, they have already been having some discussions um, uh, with either client country representatives. So I'm, I'm going to ask Vina after his presentation at some point uh, to try and um, uh, as uh, even handedly as possible uh, uh, present some of what, what he's heard from um, uh, uh, client, either client country representatives. Um, in order to make up for that lack. But I am very glad that we do have uh, Natalie Franken here, uh, uh, alternate uh, ED for EDS1 countries. That ranges from sort of Belgium to Turkey. Have I got the extent? Um, and EDS1 sorry. is the US EDS10. <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah, pardon me. EDS10. Gosh, pardon me. Yes. Um, uh, 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 pardon me. Uh, Dirk Reinemann, who is the uh, director uh, of IDA Resource Mobilization at the World Bank. And... Uh, co-host uh, Michael Jarvis, uh, Executive Director uh, at TAI, Transparency and Accountability Initiative. As I say, sort of five to ten minutes each, hopefully from them, no more than ten, uh, 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 five would be lovely. Um, and then a discussion in which we hope that other people in the room and the many joining us uh, online can join. Those of you online, I, I think we've forced you onto the mute for the moment, um, and please stay on mute. Um, except, obviously, if you are asking a question or making a comment, at which point it's very helpful to take yourself off mute, something that uh, I'm bad at. Um, uh, but please do uh, raise your hand or, or, or make a comment in the chat and we will get it. <coughs> we'll, 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 we'll get to you, we hope, uh, um, in good time. Finally, um, and sorry for all of the announcements, but uh, for those of you in the room, um, as an award for uh, uh, traipsing through the horribly British weather to get here, uh, th th there will be food afterwards. Um, uh, and so please, please do hang around. Um, and, and, and thank you for, to uh, PTF for that. Um, I think that is it for the uh, opening formalities, unless I've missed something. So, Vine, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Charles. Uh, and thank you for... Um, organizing this event and uh, I would like to uh, welcome and thank all the panelists uh, for being here and uh, all the people who are online. Hopefully uh, you can, you can uh, hear us and uh, see uh, the screen. Um, uh, I would like to begin by uh, uh, thanking the Center for Global Development and Transparency and Accountability Initiative uh, for giving us uh, this opportunity uh, to present ideas on how to expand and adequately fund engagement of civil society organizations in IDA 20 to help deliver more and better results. And the emphasis is in more and better results with accountability. These ideas are based uh, on a year-long study by uh, a team of uh, my colleagues at the PTF with financial support from Open Society Foundation and I would like to acknowledge presence of Jeff Hall from the OSF uh, for uh, helping with this. Thank you. I'm, I'm not Jeff, he's not here. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm from OSF, I'm saving one. Oh, okay. I thought Jeff was here. Jeff, I mean, Jeff is here. Jeff is here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just uh, to disclose, uh, the, the all team members uh, who worked on the study are former World Bank uh, staff, uh, so they know 
the bank uh, from inside as well as now from the outside. Um, let me see if I'm going in the right direction. Yes, the slide uh, is going to slide number two. Uh, this is uh, a especially good time for discussing an expanded role for civil society organization. Uh, why is that? There are at least seven reasons listed on the slide, but uh, uh, let me say that the IDA 20 is the largest ever, $93 billion, and it is facing the challenge of delivering results for its uh, members and the public um, with accountability for the use of the money. That's the challenge. It is also a good time because the World Bank is rethinking its uh, model and what, how it can move towards a outcome-oriented or evolution roadmap, they're calling it. And this discussion is going to be happening and the sh uh, shareholders are going to play a major role in this. It is driven by a desire to improve the country engagement model and uh, to bring about both uh, state and non-state actors uh, to deliver for uh, the people. Uh, it is also a good time because the local CSOs can be a part of the solution uh, during the multiple crises facing the IDA recipient countries. In these contexts, IDA can make a huge difference in fostering government and civil society interactions. And that is the focus of the study. Now, let me begin by sharing with you what are the roles civil society organizations currently play in IDA as well as in the World Bank. I think while our terms of reference was to focus on IDA, Given the IDA 20 context, many of the recommendations and analysis uh, broadly apply to the IDA and the World Bank. Now, at present, the civil society organizations play four roles. The first role is to facilitate citizen and stakeholder engagement in every single lending operation that the World Bank finances. So it is really a huge uh, role uh, they can play. Uh, Second role is to provide operational services as implementers to help IDA project implementing agencies. This is done when they are contracts contracted by the implementing agencies to supplement their capacity and do the service delivery. The third role is when the civil society organizations are invited by the IDA and the IDA recipient countries to participate in country engagement activities to shape the development policies and programs of the recipient countries, as well as the World Bank and IDA. This is in consultation mode and they, they participate and this is happening around the world with fairly regular frequency. So that's also a huge opportunity. The last uh, role is uh, a little bit, uh, uh, you know, under uh, utilized and not so visible, but the civil society organizations play the traditional role of monitoring and providing oversight on IDA as well as government operations to enhance accountability and uh, value for money. Now, let's look at these four roles and see whether there is room for expanding the roles and how that can be financed adequately. Because if it is just lip service, it doesn't help. There has to be money to help the CSO play these roles. So for roles one and two, as you will see on the slide, the reports analysis uh, clearly shows that uh, there is a lot of room to grow CSO engagement in IDA under these two roles. What are these two roles? One is to facilitate citizen and stakeholder engagement. And role number two is to provide operational services to help with the delivery of IDA and help supplement the implementing agencies. These two roles are important uh, in one sense that the, no new money is needed for them. They can be funded out of the project's loan proceeds and project proceeds. And uh, they can uh, be also, uh, the, 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 to make them happen is within the powers of uh, the World Bank management, as well as uh, in the power of uh, the IDA recipient uh, implementing agencies. But there are a number of issues, as you will see on the screen. One of them is that these roles are not adequately being monitored. And the money for them is not explicit in the World Bank project documents. So as a result, 
if you are not if you don't allocate the money and you don't monitor what happened exposed you don't know what has happened and that is one biggest information gap and one way to monitor it is to identify the contracts awarded to CSOs in the World Bank contracts of our database. But there is no filter to search that way and aggregate that data. Now, we must say that our analysis is preliminary. We have shared it with the World Bank colleagues to get fact checked, and we have received their comments. We have updated the information, but we, we are open to continue to learn. And if indeed uh, we have uh, misjudged uh, or uh, misrepresenting, we are still keeping the report open for consultation and we are open to, to uh, make sure that factually it is a correct situation. But at the moment, as far as our analysis shows, roles under one and two are grossly underutilized. We don't know how adequately they're funded, but our analysis shows that since there is no information available in project uh, appraisal documents, and there is no monitoring of contracts awarded, it's unlikely that money, they, that these roles are being adequately funded. That leads us to what to do about it. What is the uh, recommendation? And that's our recommendation number one. These four actions are within the mandate of the World Bank management, and we are recommending them uh, for the World Bank to do. And these can be, these roles can be funded under the existing project funding. Having said that, what are the recommended actions? One of them is that issue a policy statement and a guidance note for staff on collaboration with civil society organizations and IDA operations. The World Bank used to have such a policy statement and guidance. Somehow it is not there in the operations manual anymore. Whereas Asian Development Bank and Inter-American Development Bank have recently updated it and issued it. So I, you know, we, we hope that uh, maybe it is scattered somewhere in other documents, but it will be better to bring the, the roles CSOs uh, can play in one clear policy statement and issue a guidance for client and staff use, as has been done by other multilateral development banks. The second is that 2014 citizen engagement framework is now a bit needs updated. A lot has happened since then. And uh, uh, this is, uh, we, we, we are happy that the, the World Bank has been responsive to this, and they have just started a global stock take of what is actually happening in this. We welcome that. We hope there will be a due consultation with civil society organizations at all steps of this particular global stock taking, because otherwise, at the end, there may be disappointments. The action number three is that IDA 20 made a commitment for greater social accountability and citizen engagement, but there is no explanation of how it will be done how it will be monitored. Obviously, that should be done. Finally, add a filter in the contract of our database so that anybody anywhere can monitor how much of the role CSOs are playing in providing operational services. That's an easy fix. This data is available inside the World Bank. When we asked for uh, it under freedom of access to information, we were given this data. So it is not as if it doesn't exist. It can be aggregated, but why not disclose it and make it searchable so anybody from externally can do that. Now, that leads me to the role number three and four. So just to reiterate, for role number one and two, the actions recommended are within the powers of the World Bank management. There's no new money needed, and they can be quickly implemented and make a difference in IDA 20 delivery, particularly given the largest and ambitious scope of the IDA 20. Role number three and four <clears throat> are very important because they go to building the country systems for state and non-state interaction. And you may remember that was the theme of the World Development Report 2017, that that interaction determines the governance. Therefore, that's very important. And role number three and four both get to the heart of it. Uh, the country engagement, uh, for those of you who don't know the World Bank uh, uh, directives, uh, includes uh, analytical work, preparing the World Bank and IDA program for lending and, and advisory services for a country, systematic country diagnosis of the macroeconomic situations, and a lot of acronyms uh, on the slide, country climate and development report, uh, completion and learning reviews. All of these activities are at macro level at IDA country level. And I should have said earlier that 
the focus of our study is on IDA operations at country level, not the global the IDA replenishments. So at country level, there are a lot of these activity going on where CSOs are invited to participate and they do, but they go without adequate preparation, particularly local CSOs. Why is that? Because in order to have meaningfully participate, you need to have an analytical work, analytic analysis, and that there is no known means, as far as I know, of systematically funding the local CSOs for doing that preparatory work so that they can meaningfully participate in these uh, country engagement dialogue. Therefore, the required development of a more balanced dialogue between the government and civil society cannot happen if they don't have the necessary analytical base. The floor number four uh, is, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm discussing the issues as well as uh, the, the role. Role number four is to enhance accountability and value for money through monitoring and oversight. Obviously, this is something which cannot be funded through the projects. You cannot ask the implementing agencies to finance CSOs to hold this implementing agencies accountable. And you cannot channel the money through the government for the same thing so that the civil society can hold the government accountable. And you, so therefore, there is a need for having an independent source of funding for this important function. Why is this function important? It is important because as we know, appropriately, IDA lands in high risk situations of governance and, and corruption. In those situations, it is incumbent upon IDA to do everything possible to make sure that the money accountability in the use of money is there. And I must say that IDA, having been inside and outside, IDA does a very good job of trying to do the best it can, but it is not doing everything it can. And where it can improve, this is one area where it can bring civil society organizations as part of the project's accountability mechanisms so that there is accountability in use of money and value for money. Value for money is not just for the donors, it's also recipient governments. Our dialogue, you asked uh, Charles about reaction of FIDA recipient. They are interested in delivering value for money for their constituencies also. It's not just a donor issue. So that's our, uh, the, the role number three and four. What can be done about it? We, this is our recommendation number two, and I'm about to end my remarks uh, with, the, with the, uh, this slide and one more. Uh, there are, we are proposing that a special funding facility dedicated to funding civil society organizations to perform their roles number three and four should be set up. This is clearly not just a management issue. It is an issue of shareholders uh, and IDA deputies. Uh, and we are happy to see that Natale is here uh, representing them. And we had discussions with the African uh, board uh, uh, constituencies at the board. And I can briefly report on uh, the reaction. And this is an ongoing process. We are going to consultations, doing consultations for another two months. So this is the beginning today, not the end. So we, we are very open to doing a widespread uh, consultations with IDA recipients, as well as IDA donors, as well as the bank management, as well as uh, other potential uh, uh, constituencies which might be willing to provide money into this, con into this facility. So what will be the objectives of this? Three things, analytical work to flow in the IDA's country engagement activities. That will build country systems and country ownership of the development agenda and dialogue between state and non-state uh, actors for greater results and for uh, development. The second is to in fund third party monitoring by civil society organization as part of other accountability mechanisms being embedded in the projects for projects which have high governance and fiduciary risks. Now the, the, the World Bank and IDA have a system of assessing the risk, the governance and fiduciary risks for every single project. And this is a public information. So there is a transparent criteria for it, which is an excellent thing. And they rate them on four categories, high, substantial, medium, and low. So we are recommending that focus on the ones which are rated high for the governance and fiduciary risk. Finally, people, there is need for capacity building for country engagement activities and third party monitoring in local civil society organizations. Now, one of the arguments people say, 
we can't do third party monitoring because local CSOs don't have capacity. That's a catch 22. They don't have capacity because they don't have any money to do that work. So the, our recommendation is to include capacity building and learning by doing. It will take time to develop a local uh, uh, enough core capacity of local civil society organizations to do this, but we won't get there if we don't start somewhere. Now, the next point I want to make is that this facility, the question people ask is, yeah, but you know, the bilateral organizations and foundations provide money directly to civil society organizations. So what is the need for a special facility? So we in the report have done a lot of analysis of the flows of ODA money to civil society organizations. And also this data is published by OECD, DAC, what percentage of that money goes to international civil society organizations, to donor country-based civil society organizations, and to local CS civil society organizations. And our uh, finding, again, subject to more data and analysis if needed, is that only about one to 2% of that bilateral or foundation money really goes to local civil society organizations. Now, the point we are making is that it's not an alternative to bilateral funding, the multilateral facility. It is in addition to it. And the multilateral facility offers certain key advantages which bilaterals don't have. The bilateral, no matter what country it is, uh, if it is known that a local civil society organization is receiving a money from India as a donor, there will be a aura that they will be biased somehow by the Indian perspective. Similarly, if the local CSO is funded by China, they will have that aura. If it is by United States, that will have an aura. Sometimes that can interfere with the objectivity and the receptivity. A multilateral facility where the money goes in one part and how it is distributed, who gets it, are sort of delinked, is the way to go and will make a, a lot of... Uh, uh, support for lower local civil society organizations. So such a multilateral facility was started by the World Bank and Global Partnership for Social Accountability. But for a variety of reasons, that didn't uh, deliver on all the expectations. They are going through a review at the moment, and we think they have a potential to be restructured to serve these objectives uh, and, and build on their assets. And their biggest asset is that about 43 IDA recipients have given a license to Global Partnership for Social mm -hmm. Accountability that you can directly fund civil society organizations in my territory without my case-by-case -case approval. That is significant. 43 IDA recipient countries out of 74 have given this license already. The problem is there isn't enough money in Global Partnership uh, rather than uh, some other constraints. Now, who is likely to give uh, put money and who should put, put money into this proposed uh, multilateral uh, uh, facility, uh, uh, which can be set up either through an existing trust fund or a new trust fund at the World Bank to maintain the objectivity and avoid conflict of interest? Uh, it, what, first of all, all the people who want to maximize value for money in IDA. Remember, the role number four is about maximizing value for money. That includes IDA recipients as well as uh, progressive, as well as IDA donors. Second is there is a lot of discussion going on in donor community, as you know, about localizing the civil society support for civil society organizations. This is to support local civil society organizations. And with all the auras I described about the Indian and the Chinese and the Americans, perhaps a multilateral facility, IDA aura, is probably the least uh, troublesome for the recipient countries. And there is least possibility of pushback against that uh, because there is a long trust between IDA and the IDA recipients. And the IDA recipients sit on the governing bodies of uh, the IDA and the trust funds, et cetera. So anybody who is willing to support localization of CSOs might consider putting some of their money into this kind of a facility to promote that objective. Finally, all those who are supporters of open government and open society would be interested in the all the roles uh, which uh, have been role three and four, which have been described. So let me conclude uh, by thanking you uh, for your attention. 
and uh, say that if these two recommendations are followed up, uh, uh, they will help uh, IDA deliver a number of economic, social, and financial benefits. And I think there will be local ownership, increased local ownership of development agenda, more and better results can be delivered because the CSOs will deliver as facilitators, as implementers, as advocates, and as monitors. So they will be able to do that. The open society objectives will be furthered because of more effective implementation of citizen engagement, stakeholder engagement, more inclusion, and social accountability. And social sustainability will be enhanced uh, through these uh, actions. And finally, there will be enhanced value for money and accountability by enhancing the IDA's already well-regarded systems for accountability. Uh, and it will help mitigate corruption, waste, and diversion, which almost every government will at least say uh, that they want to, to eliminate that, even if they don't. But those are uh, some of the re emerging recommendations and findings of the study. And as I said, the study will be made available we will, all those who have signed up will receive an email about a link where they can download the study. The, it will be available for two months uh, for consultations. And we will be continuing the advocacy on these recommendations with the key stakeholders, which include US civil society organizations, the foundations, the IDA donors, the IDA recipients, uh, and uh, the other uh, think tanks and organizations uh, uh, who are interested in this agenda. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Binay. And we'll make sure that the... Pardon me. <laughs> Pandemic has taught me nothing. Uh, thank you, Binay. Uh, we'll make sure the link uh, to uh, the report is also on the event website, um, uh, CGD website as well. Um, I am going to go, if that's all right, Natalie Dirk, and then uh, my co-host, Michael, last. I should have mentioned, uh, Dirk, thanks very much for joining us. I know you have to leave a little bit early, but uh, hopefully there'll, there'll, there'll be plenty, plenty of time for, for, for discussion. Natalie. Yes, thank you very much, Charles. And thank you very much, Vine, for the very comprehensive presentation. Um, I think we, we all agree, let's say, um, as, as, as donors, um, and board members to the different roles of um, that you've described for civil society. And, and we do take uh, the recommendations at heart and we will ensure proper follow-up. Um, just a couple of reflections from, from my side. I think if you call for, for fun extra funding, that is well noted, but I do think we absolutely want to call not to have a separate facility, but to work with what is already there. I think recipient country governments and recipient country organizations, civil society organizations um, are already, uh, let's say, struggling a lot with trying to tap into different uh, channels of financing. So I think it would be good to, to work with the Global Partnership for Social Accountability, which is already a multi-donor trust fund managed by the World Bank, and to try to improve it um, and, and to see that there is enough financing in that um, GPSA. And of course, as you mentioned, also the evaluation will come up at the end of the year. So we think it will be very valuable to, to look at the evaluation and to make sure it, it, it's improved. Um, on a couple of reflections on what the Royal Bank Board is doing uh, in terms of, of ensuring proper civil society engagement and citizen engagement. So we do believe citizen engagement um, has become more of a mechanistic agenda, a ticking of the boxes. And we do think it would be very, very important uh, to ensure that there's an, an, an enhanced debt and quality of citizen engagement. And it remains also a key corporate priority for the bank at institutional level and across country programs. We wanna ensure that this is um, well incorporated in the bank's activities. Um, now, um, in terms of the IDA 19 policy commitment, just to give you some information on that. So what was achieved already in January 2022, um, multi-stakeholder platforms were strengthened in 42% of IDA countries. We would like to see that go up to 100. And uh, since the launch of the civil um, society uh, engagement strategy in fiscal year 14, there's been a significant upward trend in percentage of CPFs that reference uh, citizen engagement activities. And so there's an 11-fold increase in the average number of 
citizen engagement references in CPFs per fiscal year. So that's already what we've achieved, let's say, collaborating together uh, with your advocacy, with thanks to your advocacy and also by reaching out to us. Uh, but more can definitely uh, be done. Then the board is also um, trying to to make sure that uh, citizen engagement is embedded across other corporate priorities, not only IDA, IDA covers a lot, but of course there's also IBRD, there's also the other institutions, including uh, climate change, the COVID response, the social inclusions and FCV. And there is also guidance notes being prepared uh, in these different uh, areas. There's a strategic options paper, which is planned to come to the board in fiscal year 23, and we're waiting for that and very much looking forward to that, which would examine opportunities to scale up citizen engagement in FCV context. And we're also um, looking at complementarities between uh, citizen engagement and so social inclusion through uh, technical notes on disability and inclu inclusive citizen engagement and planned work on strengthening uh, citizen engagement for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex uh, people. So that's also something to keep in mind. Um, there are some projects that have show good examples of uh, including multi-stakeholder consultative groups and civil society-led independent oversight uh, bodies and how, do, how these, uh, or these um, mechanisms can be strengthened. And we also try to, to learn lessons uh, from that and take it forward. Then a review of the World Bank Finance Client Procurement found that from fiscal year 16 to 21, 21% 21 of IJAP projects included at least one contract to a CSO. Um, we'd like to see more, uh, but there are data. And I think the importance is there's lots of data at the World Bank, but it's not always shown to the outside world, um, the richesse of the data that are there. And, um, and in fiscal year 23, the World Bank will assess the extent to which these contracts finance uh, accountability related activities. We've also been in discussion with uh, the independent evaluation group, as you know, Vine, and um, the independent evaluation group has, set, has done this excellent evaluation in 2014. There was a stock taking and there now, there's now a learning engagement and Ellie will be able to, to get back uh, to that and provide more information on, on how can we look at the citizen engagement indicators that already are incorporated in different projects in the CPFs and how can we strengthen them uh, going forward. So this is at the moment where we are and uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Charles. Uh, thanks for the invite, <clears throat> and uh, uh, thanks to Vinay and uh, and team as well. I saw uh, Dirk Matthijsen quickly on the screen there, and I, and and Gave Tata is here, etc. All um, old colleagues and friends. So it's really nice to engage um, on this topic. I'm the new IDA director, so I've been on the job for two and a half uh, months. Um, so I welcome this discussion also as part of my own uh, onboarding and 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 learning about this topic. Um, uh, I wanted to just uh, say a few things. One is about sort of the role of the CSOs, NGOs that we see uh, in IDA. Uh, secondly, a point, uh, a broader point on aid architecture, and, and Vinay um, uh, referenced that all, already. And then talk about what we're doing in IDA 19 and IDA 20 specifically uh, and concretely. Um, on the role, um, I think Natalie has already. Uh, put it very well, right? The, we're, we're in clear alignment um, um, and, and see the very valuable role that CSOs and NGOs play. And that's true for the part one CSOs and NGOs um, and for the part two, as we call them, the ones in, in borrower countries, um, of course. I've spent most of my bank career in operations and a lot of that in country. Uh, and I've seen that firsthand, how important that is, both on the side of service delivery, um, but also on the side of accountability uh, mechanisms, what we sometimes call the demand side of governance, right? Incredibly important. Um, and we, so the question is, how do we support this more, right? And what's the role? But clearly um, aligned. <clears throat> Second point I want to make on this is that the business model of the bank, obviously, and the authors of the study know this very well, the business model of the bank is a little bit different in the sense that it is actually exclusively, almost exclusively about lending to governments. That's just the way we're structured, right? These are borrowers. 
um, they take out loans um, from the bank. Um, and we take pride in that too, because we think that there ought to be a bunch of donors who actually do that, right? And support and strengthen government and strengthen government systems and build capacity for service delivery, build capacity for governance, not outside of government only, but inside of government, first and foremost, procurement, financial management, anti-corruption. These are all core government services, right? Somebody's got to be doing that uh, too. And we think that is still the right model uh, for the bank to pursue, right? I think that's a comparative advantage of the bank that we have with the global footprint that we have and that we're increasing with presence on the ground, with the close and trusting operational relationship that we have with our client countries. And let me make the point on, on aid architecture here, if we, and Vinay referenced it, we take a step back and we look at, you know, we said at Busan and at Accra and at Paris that we do what we just said, what I just said. We would strengthen governments, we would put governments in the driver's seat, and we would respect ownership. Well, the data speaks a little different, uh, a different language. Only 45%, 40 to 45% of ODA flows through government. The vast majority of aid flows outside of government, right? So that's very interesting. So the question is then, in the big picture, right, should we look at channeling more of funding outside of government, right, including by carving out a piece of IDA, which, you know, theoretically we can do if we agree with the deputies, if we agree with the boroughs. But is that the right way to go for an institution which has this comparative strength of actually strengthening government? So I just put that out there as a question. Or should our emphasis be on figuring out how to improve the effectiveness and the efficiency of the 55%, right? And I take the point that um, Benet made, that if you look at that 55%, a lot of that is bilateral agency, nothing wrong with that. They do very good work. I come from a bilateral originally myself. A lot of that is quangos, quasi-NGOs that are really not NGOs. A lot of this is ingos, right? International NGOs with a local footprint. But the ones that we are talking about in terms of accountability mechanisms, the serious local NGOs who are actually credible to hold governments accountable are getting uh, a fraction of that money. So should we not look at how we can rebalance that a little bit within that, right? So that's that's a bit the aid architecture question, the, uh, the bigger one. But back to the bank, I don't want to uh, punt, the, <laughs> punt the issue. So what are we doing? What are we doing in IDA? I think I, I started at the bank 26 years ago, and I remember when Jim Wolfenson in the boardroom um, essentially said we have to um, refocus, we have to open up to CSOs and NGOs. That's 26 years ago. And I think the bank has come an incredible uh, way in, in uh, far on that on that way um, since then. But more has to be done. The study is really good for this, and we need to do advocacy more. So the advocacy, I just want to say that explicitly, is very, very welcome that you're doing. Natalie already spoke about the comprehensive stock taking that we're doing, not in my group, but on the citizens' engagement agenda. So we're very keen on observing that. Strongly agree with the point that Natalie made as well. This is not just an IDA agenda. This is an IBRD agenda just as much, a middle-income country agenda, right? And as we're talking about in the evolution roadmap about uh, potentially strengthening our, our um, engagement with middle-income countries around global public goods, this will become very important um, there as well. So I think we need to uh, keep, it, um, keep it broad on that. Um, let me just recap very quickly on, on IDA 19. Uh, so what we're doing is we're doing an IDA 19 um, retrospective. We're busy writing that at the moment. We have policy commitments um, on that to establish and strengthen platforms for engaging with multiple stakeholders, including women as well as vulnerable groups in policy making implementation to enhance public participation, accountability, and responsiveness. So we're going to report back on that and say how far have we come. And some of the numbers that Natalie mentioned will, will flow into that. The other one is on IDA 20, and again, we have new commitments there um, with the focus on building back better. Um, their uh, participants in the IDA 20 negotiations saw a need to improve the specificity of the IDA 19 citizen engagement commitment. So that's already been a bit improved, and I'm sure we can do even better than that. Um, but we'll, we're monitoring that actively because IDA 20 has just begun. We're just at the end of the second quarter of the first year. Um, and this is about, again, helping enhance the role of citizen engagement by supporting more community action and building climate resilience. There it is. And mitigation or commitments on enhancing accountability and transparency in the delivery of public services in FCV countries. So again, very close monitoring on that. And we'll have 
by the time of the midterm review, which we will produce by the end of almost exactly 12 months ago uh, from now, uh, right in the in the next year. Um, we're doing a lot as well, in, not in my group, but around raising awareness of staff. I think the environmental and, and uh, social safeguards that have been mentioned already are the floor of our engagement. That's the minimum that we must do. But obviously, we want our staff to be doing more than the minimum and to actually engage over and above that. And that requires guidance and that requires, um, you know, I'm sure um, our colleagues in OPCS are looking at the point that you made around maybe summarizing all of the documents that we have in some kind of policy statement. Again, not in my group, but sounds like something that is reasonable and, and, and useful uh, to do. Um, on the funding mechanism. Uh, so again, I, I agree with um, Natalie's point, and I think, Vinay, that's what you're suggesting as well. I, for the last five years, I was in charge of trust fund reform and the FIF reform, so I can only strengthen, only underline the need to use existing facilities. Um, the GPSA um, is being evaluated right now, uh, which is a great opportunity. I also see the other um, opportunity of the roadmap evolution uh, discussion where we are looking at a more rational use of grant funding. And, and I would think that we can make a strong case uh, to upgrade GPSA and to replenish it um, much more fully so that it can play that role much more fully. I would also add that it's not just the sovereign donors um, that, are, that could be potentially interested, but also philanthropies. Right. At the moment, we have no way of attracting uh, the Gates and the Bezos, et cetera, of this world into IDA. Um, but here's a perfect way to have a complementary vehicle that could actually receive some of that funding and then bring it to use also in IDA countries. So let me stop there. But I, again, just really welcome the discussion and the good study. Thank you, Dirk. Uh, I have to say, uh, I, I fully agree with your words on IDA's comparative advantage. Um, I think you might have things to say about the private sector window, but that's a different hobby horse of mine. Um, Michael, what do you feel about IDA's comparative advantage? <laughs> thanks, Charles, and thanks all for joining in person on, and those online. Um, the Transparency and Accountability Initiative, we're delighted to co-host with CGD today. And just so for those who might not know, we're pretty poorly named. We're actually a funder collaborative, so it's a group of largely philanthropic funders, Chandler, Ford, Luminate, Hewlett, MacArthur, OSF, Skoll Foundations, and then we have USAID and FCDO as observer bilateral members. Um, and they've all been funding around this agenda for a long time. And our role is to try and coordinate those efforts, think about what next and, and what's been working or not in the past. So we were really delighted to see this analysis and thanks to one of our members, OSF, for, for commissioning it. Um, I think it's well-timed. I think it's one of the clearest overviews I've seen of civil society roles and engagement within, within the bank. Um, and as other speakers have alluded to, there's a lot of moving parts right now, so this can really inform some of those discussions. Um, there are some revelations in there. Like I think I was struck by one of the statistics that only 4% of the 1,000 approved projects, uh, FY18 to 21, that were deemed to be citizen-centric, only, only those 4% chose to use the citizen monitoring tool, which seems pretty low bar to me, but we could certainly improve upon. Um, and I think IEG are right in there that this is sort of a missed opportunity that we can build on, and I'm not actually hearing pushback against that idea from, from others. Um, I think some of the specific suggestions in there just seem easily actionable. The, the point around the corporate monitoring that should be extended from looking at citizen engagement beyond just design phase of projects, but actually to the implementation phase, um, that would be very helpful. The point that's already been made about disaggregating the contract award data to allow you to see which ones are going to CSOs. My only question there is that you know, I actually think we should be shifting more to a model of grants, not contracts. And if you look at the World Bank procurement guidelines, it's very hard for most local CSOs to even have a hope of meeting those. So to look obsessed on the corporate procurement data, I think is a bit of a red herring. Then I think the key point is that you know some of this work can really pay for itself, as, as alluded to in the paper. And I think particularly those roles three and four around 
and the independent monitoring of projects are very compelling arguments and sellable arguments in future replenishments of IDA. And I think given the pressures on, on aid agendas right now, being able to talk as do with donor partners about value for money and issuing accountability of spending and strengthening that e ecosystem is going to be important increasingly. So I think it's actually a self-serving step if, if IDA could take this move more comprehensively. Um, and I do think that dedicated resourcing for that sort of oversight role is critical. We, we just did an analysis of civil society roles around pushing for accountability and transparency on pandemic funding and, and uh, responses. And clearly civil society had a very active role, um, an important one, and often were using redeploying their own core resources and money from other purposes to be able to play that. More, more could have been done if there was dedicated funding around. Um, I think within the bank, there are some interesting precedents emerging. Uh, the Global Partnership for Education has sort of an accountability window and direct grants to civil society. I think in practice, those have tended to default to advocacy funding, not actually the monitoring and, and oversight role, um, but in theory, they could be used for that. I've been part of conversations around the new pandemic fund and what could be built into those. And I think, again, that's a, an opportunity area. And uh, a few of the TI members have recently invested in the new governance and institutions <clears throat> trust fund uh, the, the World Bank governance practice has set up, partly with an ambition of like encouraging more flexible innovations around engagement with civil society and, and thinking about the roles they can play in, in across the project cycle. So it'll be interesting to see what might come out of that. Um, I think I have three questions, maybe challenges a little bit to the PTF team and where this could go. So one is potential unintended consequences of this shift um, and providing this resourcing to local groups. Um, would it, you know, it's such a scarce financial environment for them that would they just follow the money and basically become contractors at the World Bank providing these monitoring roles and not fulfilling their core missions uh, which I think is a real risk. Um, it would be their choice, obviously, but I, I, I do think that's one question that we should think about. It's the analogy in the philanthropy debate right now of providing project funding, which is very instrumental versus core funding, which is to allow for more systemic change and sort of reinforcing ecosystems. So that's one concern. Um, I think how do you bring local communities into those processes and have them have some ownership is, is something we don't have perfect answers on, but would be important. Um, there was a recent study by Mushtaq Khan around climate adaptation funding in Bangladesh and demonstrating that where local communities saw win-wins, like they were actually going to get immediate infrastructure benefits from those projects, as well as they were going to build resilience against future flooding and other climate risks. They then took much more active role in, in oversight of those projects and assuring reduced leakage. So they could actually document reductions in, in, in corruption and other risks uh, as a result of that. So I think that's projects like that are, are, are yielding insights that we could be building into this research. And I do think there's a question about interactions with existing government accountability institutions and are we usurping their role? Like they, they have a mandate as well in this space. So how do those engage? And then lastly, and I will stop, um, is around, are we thinking big enough? Like, uh, is the bank actually ever going to be the right institution to be funding civil society at scale? Um, does it even want to be? I think that's come up. And I know of one case, not naming names, of a and you just got a grant through the bank two and a half years after it was initially committed to. Um, so you're not going to turn this tanker around overnight. And I it makes me wonder if we actually need a, accountability fund that, that would tap part of that 55% of ODA that Dirk was mentioning that multiple funders could feed into and that would not be specific to bank projects, but really trying to reinforce accountability at local and national level in, in priority countries um, and prioritizes funding to those local groups, not, not the INGOs. And I think that's a, something that we should be exploring. Maybe that feeds into the successor to GPSA or the evolution of GPSA. Um, they might not be mutually exclusive, but I do worry about assuming that bank rules can be adjusted to be something that's actually fit for purpose for what we're talking about. So let me end there, Chels. Fantastic stuff. Um, everybody's been very patient. I, I want to come back to me and two things. Uh, one is 
any burning responses to anything you've just heard. Um, uh, but two, if you could mention anything more you have to say about uh, 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 client countries of IDA and, and any any responses you've heard from representatives there, that would be that would be great. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think a lot of what has been said, we we are all in alignment. Uh, it is a question of uh, some differences of views uh, and some uh, uh, properly addressing some of the risks pointed out by Michael. How, how do we manage these objectives and avoid the unintended consequences? Uh, so I, I don't think there is any need for any burning responses, but we can have other questions and discussions. Uh, the On the IDA recipient's point of view, uh, what we plan to do is that this two-month consultation period uh, that we have ahead of us, during that, we plan to interact with a number of um, IDA recipient civil society organizations more than what we have already. For example, there are joint government and civil society steering committees in 13 IDA recipient countries. So we plan to, we have already requested OGP assistance and they have agreed that they will facilitate our dialogue with them. So we will be directly able to hear from them. Uh, uh, we know that, uh, as I said, 43 uh, IDA countries have opted into GPSA. So we'll use, uh, we'll ask Ali's help to help facilitate a dialogue with some of the global partners uh, uh, who exist in IDA recipient countries. There are 400 global partners of CSOs. Uh, that is another asset of GPSA. So we will use that avenue. Uh, we are, we have already met with the, uh, uh, one of the well, the alternate executive director uh, who couldn't be here today was because of being his head of state being in town. But we had a dialogue with him, and he has uh, he gave us reactions which are also similar to other reactions which have been received here. That we he agrees very much with the objectives. It makes sense. He thinks this will be received well by uh, by uh, his uh, uh, constituents. Uh, but there should be certain risks and safeguards and railings which will need to be followed. I think he definitely thinks that a multilateral financing framework for local supporting local CSOs will be much more acceptable to IDA recipients than a fragmented bilateral number of bilaterals working in their territories, uh, which aid architecture, the aid fragmentation issues are well known. Uh, I think uh, we agreed uh, that uh, uh, through his uh, uh, good uh, will and uh, support, uh, there will be further dialogue between the IDA recipient board member staff and constituencies, which uh, he is part of. Uh, so we will plan to have continued dialogue with that. Uh, I think uh, what so far our takeaway is that uh, men, it's not that all IDA recipients will jump straight away and applaud and welcome uh, this, uh, this, these recommendations uh, that we are proposing. But uh, there are enough progressive elements who are interested in this agenda, who have, for example, opted for support of CSOs through GPSA, or who have opted for OGP uh, membership. Uh, so there will be enough uh, bodies there, uh, enough countries who would be willing to take up this. And then last point I want to make is that uh, this independent third party monitoring in high governance and high fiduciary risk projects is not something new. IDA and World Bank already do it. I think when, especially when the integrity vice presidency of the World Bank founds instances of allegations of corruption and they investigate and found some evidence, a follow up action plan is generally agreed on how the operations can resume with adequate risk mitigation. And invariably, almost all of them include some independent third party monitoring. The largest independent third party monitoring program was of course in Afghanistan, running more than $50 million over the past uh, 15, 20 years. So, you know, and th there was the obvious need for it. So in FCV countries, which comprise about half of the IDA recipients, the third party monitoring has a specific role. And the European Commission commissioned a study, which we have cited in, the, in our report 
on what are the good practices of third party monitoring in FCV situations. That study is brilliant study. It makes enough case how it can be done, what are the good practices to follow after doing the proper study. The World Bank Environment and Social Framework, ESF, has a good guidance note for use by the World Bank borrowers, including IDA borrowers, on how and when to use third party monitoring to mitigate social and, and uh, environmental risks. But the concepts are the same, whether it is social or environmental risk or governance and fiduciary risk. So this is not something which we have invented or come up new. This is already there. It's a matter of building on these experiences, reviewing those which we haven't done in the report. We haven't been able to analyze the actual experience with these third party monitoring, uh, which is already being done. And we didn't have enough resources for that. But as the work goes forward, this will need to be analyzed and one can learn and build on that experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hopefully the IEG study will cover some of that. Um, already have a, a few comments on the chat that I, uh, I want to get to uh, before I get to the room. Um, uh, and Carolyn, I see you just stuck your hand up. Let me um, uh, uh, read out these comments and then uh, come to you, Carolyn, and then come to the room. Um, uh, John, John Garrison basically said, wh where is this new facility going to be based? I think this is, you know, a, a, a live discussion that I'd love to hear uh, more people discuss. Uh, uh, GPSA, GPSA plus, new thing within, new thing without, all of the above, who knows? Uh, but anyway, uh, more thoughts on that uh, from everybody. Very welcome. Uh, Pierre Landel Mills uh, said the elephant is in the room is the politics of efforts to improve governance. Um, we need to recognize that corruption and abuse power is central to the challenge and that governments are extremely resistant to being held accountable. Um, uh, genuine pro progress in promoting better governments must come from internal pressure from citizens and civil society. Thus, funding agencies need to develop new mechanisms for channeling support to local non-government actors. And I think this is something we've heard again and again. That Ingo is a great, but we're not talking Ingo, um, uh, uh, which are low-profile, unbureaucratic, and indirect. Um, uh, so, Caroline, let me come come to you, um, and then and then to the room. Thanks, Charles. Um, I really wish I could have been there in person. I, I had a was unable to be, but um, I really welcome this conversation and this work. Um, thanks to Vinay and colleagues who worked on this. I'm, I, I'm, I, I very much am supportive in general of the broad recommendations, but look forward to digging into the report and providing more detailed comments. But a few thoughts to uh, pick up on what's been said, but also to spice up maybe the conversation a little bit. Um, some of you may know, so I'm Carolyn Reynolds. I currently, my current role, um, is co-founder of a relatively um, young uh, NGO, the Pandemic Action Network that started two and a half years ago. Um, but as some of you know, and I have former colleagues in the room, I spent many, many years at the bank in charge of civil, global civil society engagement. Um, uh, John, uh, among others, was my colleague on the team. But um, And then uh, more recently, before I left the bank in 2016, was in charge of um, external relations for human development. So I come at this from the perspective as someone who fought that long fight of um, civil society engagement uh, in the bank, including uh, Dirk, you were talking back to the days of Jim Wolfenson, who I worked very closely with, and um, actually um, was working with Vinay at the time when we tabled the um, issues and options paper for civil society at the board in 2005, so a long time ago. And I feel sometimes like parts of this conversation are Groundhog Day of being repeated. And I mean, I don't wanna diminish the progress that's been made over the years. There has been a lot, as you said, Dirk, um, but in some ways, we also continue to fight the same battles over and over again, project by project, country by country, issue by issue, um, fifth by fifth. Um, now with the pandemic fund, we're going to have to fight that um, yet again, um, uh, trust fund by trust fund. So, you know, it's I think it's very welcome to think about this at this moment in time and, and you know, long overdue in terms of um, the, the next step that's needed to systematize, if you will, the way that the bank and IDA in particular, but you're right, this is an IDA and IBRD issue, IBRD issue as well, systematizes its, its engagement because that is what's the problem. Um, and, and the fact is that despite the civil citizen engagement framework and all these things that we've been talking about, it's still the fact that the incentives to promote meaningful civil society engagement in projects are not there in a consistent fashion. Um, 
it's still highly dependent upon individual bank staff and management champions and willingness to engage in that. It depends so much on the country's own enabling environment and government willingness um, and how the bank uses its relationship with the government to prioritize that or not. Um, I think there's a real question also about the progress, the metrics that we have in place to measure this. Often it's about, you know, how many times is civil society mentioned in document X or whatever. Um, those are not meaningful metrics that I think we need to be honest about. Um, so, you know, there is a lot that's happening. There's a lot more to do. I, I agree that GPSA could be strengthened and evolved, um, but it does need, to, I think there is a real case for hardwiring this to IDA and to IBRD, but let's talk about IDA now, um, and, as well as to in, in, in substantially increase the investment that we're talking about. Although a little money goes a long way, but we do have to invest in that. Um, and there needs to be support for consultation and engagement of civil society, as well as for that sort of support for, you know, and, you know, engaging analytically as partners, but also for implementation. Um, so I think uh, thinking about this as a comprehensive multilateral framework makes sense. There's also, frankly, efficiencies to be gained in terms of not figuring this out project by project, which is inefficient, but also frankly leads to us reinventing the wheel every time, not following best practices, uh, again, dependent upon who's, in, who's involved in uh, projects and, and decision making. Um, and, and it is also about, it's about money. It's also about staff on IDA teams, on country teams, but also how civil society, you know, uh, the you know, external relations teams and, and the civil society staff who work on this in the bank and the team that I used to lead um, are, are brought into those discussions early and throughout. Um, just a couple last points that, um, you know, so many civil society organizations, particularly local ones, but even a lot of international ones, I speak from experience, are living hand to mouth. So it's, it's you know, as you say, this is a, uh, this is a, you know, a vicious uh, a catch 22, um, but they have to bend themselves to lean to, to whatever funding is available. And often there is not very much to be quite frank, um, because philanthropy, there's still uh, limited philanthropy to engage in many of these, uh, to, to engage in bank related work. Um, uh, so, but, but what money there is often, a lot of that is shrinking and shifting or constantly shifting, but NGOs have to bend themselves and twist themselves into pretzels and frankly, spend so much energy trying to seek that funding just to stay alive that it's very hard to, um, to have any additional capacity. So there is a real issue there. Um, the TI uh, colleague who spoke mentioned the pandemic fund, something I've been working deeply on and pushing for you know, that to be you know, a next model. I, I hope that we, are, we can have meaningful civil society engagement, but again, it's meaningless without support. But you asked a question, which I think we should dig into. Is the World Bank going to be the right group to fund CSOs at scale? Well, no, but maybe yes, because the bank is a really important market shaper for aid overall, as we know, as it is for domestic resource mobilization. So having the bank do this, lean into it, prioritize it and fund it in a meaningful way actually can help shift the whole system. So, um, you know, I think those are just some thoughts I wanted to leave you with. I also, one last point, Dirk and, and to the, and, and Benet to your issues of why this is valuable. Um, I would add, there's also about Ida's own reputational risk and the benefit that um, leaning into this engagement early often throughout the project cycle uh, can actually help to support and um, 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 Ida um, overall and build that political um, support going forward. Thanks. Thanks, Callan. Pierre, I see your hand is raised, but Frank has been waiting patiently. So uh, I'm going to let Frank come in and then go back to you. Okay. Is that right? Um, hello, I'll be very brief. Um, my name is Frank Vogel. I'm the chairman of the board of the Partnership for Transparency Fund. And thank you very much, CGD and uh, uh, the Open Society, uh, for supporting this and, and pushing this. It's, it's marvelous. Um, and what a contrast. I mean, there was a time when NGOs would simply go up to Capitol Hill, get a friendly senator, organize a hearing, which would demand that the World Bank and IDA change things. And actually that's why IDA now supports environmental programs. Uh, it wasn't a nice cozy discussion like this. Um, so it's great to have this discussion and thank you. Uh, um, I've got a few very brief points. Um, 
a fundamental question here is, are, is this all about supporting uh, CSOs? Yes, but even more, it's about improving the projects of the bank and IDA. If the bank and IDA want to really up, uh, improve the results to the benefit of all of the people who they try to serve, then they need to do this. I don't think it's an option. Um, it's very interesting, you know, going back 30, more, 30, more than 30 years, the World Bank always produces its annual performance report on results on Christmas Eve. You, last year it was the 23rd of December. It's usually a Friday night, and they do it so that nobody notices. Um, and actually, the results have been improving, which, but no, they still hide it. Nevertheless, this is about improving the actual effectiveness of the bank and IDA. And we've come to a point, I think, globally where that cannot be achieved without much deeper partnership with civil society. That's the first point. Second point I would make is when making these arguments, people come back to you and they say, does civil society actually have the skills and the capacity? 30 years ago, when I was involved in um, creating uh, Transparency International and lobbying Jim Rolfenson soon after, um, the answer was no. Today, through hundreds of PTF-funded projects, and we've just had the annual meeting of, of, of Transparency International a weekend before last, uh, absolutely yes. The professional skills of CSOs in many, many countries today are very high and exactly good enough to be partners in particular areas. And I think that's very important in, as a fundamental in this discussion. Third point, um, if I may, uh, if I can find it, mm -hmm. uh, CSOs need small amounts of money. They don't need millions. This poses a real problem for the bank. It poses a problem for bilateral aid agencies. It means that there has to be a structure in place uh, that can actually intermediate to provide the 20,000 bucks and the 30,000 bucks to a CSO, which may be all that's needed to be able to help seriously making a project effective. Uh, before GPSA was created, the bank had such a facility. And in fact, that was how PTF did its first uh, grants. Uh, and then it abandoned it for this crazy GPSA system. Uh, and I hope as you're reviewing GPSA, uh, we can really talk about how that should, model should be done as it used to be done. Final point is the point that um, Michael Jarvis made and that Carolyn Reynolds made. And it really comes to the incentives that the bank staff have to work with CSOs. In PTF's experience, there have been times when we've done a joint project. We're actually doing one in Zambia right now with the bank. It takes forever to get this organized. We are taken through so many hoops that we're about to give up. And then even when we're doing the project, we're taken through more and more hoops. So it suggests that the bank really doesn't have the incentive. And so I asked President Mulpas about this very explicitly, and he said, oh, it's up to the country director. Um, I won't comment further on that, but the point I'm trying to make is there has to be in this program more than just nice directives to staff. There has to be the leadership at the bank that recognizes how important this is. Uh, and if it happens, um, then the people that Ida tries to serve will be better off. And I think that's where our focus should lie. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. I, I, I wanted you to say more in a minute uh, on, 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 on why the GPSA doesn't work. I, it would be an interesting thing, you know, we had the GPSA, GPSA we created the GPSA, it's sort of meant to be doing what we're talking about here. And clearly there is a fair amount of underlying dissatisfaction with the GPSA. It would be nice to know, you know, how is it fixed kind of thing. But um, Pierre, uh, uh, I promise to come back to you. Pierre, you with us? You're on mute still. Yeah, uh, there we are, good. Um, I wanted to say, first of all, I would really welcome this discussion. I think it's a really important uh, initiative and I think uh, uh, we must find ways of making, making it successful. Um, sorry about that. Uh, but, uh, 
I think we need to recognize that uh, CSOs are in a very difficult situation. We need to recognize the political context on which all of this is done. And the more success CSOs have in holding governments uh, accountable, the greater the pushback will be. And the greater the initiatives will be to, to curb the scope they have for doing that. Uh, and this is something which we have to be very, very cautious and very smart in trying to promote. Uh, I think we have to do it, but we have to recognize the reality of the, of the context. Uh, and we have to find mechanisms which are new. Now, I think Frank uh, had hit uh, a number of nails on the head very well, uh, particularly how to work with the World Bank. I mean, having spent years in the World Bank myself and then uh, tried to work with it uh, through PDF afterwards, uh, I know how, how difficult it is uh, to uh, engage with the bank and its bureaucratic procedures. So there has to be some mechanism which moves the money from either to some other agency that can handle the money much more uh, adroitly, much more uh, flexibly, much more uh, uh, aware of the political context in which they're uh, operating. Uh, and, I, and I think that uh, we, we need something quite new. We can't keep going down the idea that the bank staff are going to administer in detail relations with CSOs because that will be a disaster. Uh, we need to have people who really know about working with uh, CSOs can uh, use mechanisms that are very flexible uh, and unbureaucratic uh, and are very uh, politically astute. Uh, so I welcome the idea of the bank doing this. We had suggested it for the Ida replenishment in 2000, uh, and that was rejected at that time. Uh, but I think coming back to it again, uh, there is no alternative but to support civil society if we want to see improvements in governance. Only civil society, local civil society, can achieve uh, the kind of political pressure on governments to change. The idea that the bank can change governments or that bilateral donors can change, we've demonstrated that again and again and again doesn't work. Uh, they, they, they say yes, 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 and they, say, and they do exactly the opposite. They have an absolute reason, uh, a huge incentive to undermine everything that the bank tries to do uh, in, in holding them accountable. Uh, so it, only if civil society can bring the kind of pressure to bear uh, on these governments, will anything change? And I think we therefore we have to design this mechanism uh, in a way that takes that into account. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, uh, come, on, come on down. Yeah. Now, very rich discussion. Very glad to be here. I'm Ali Rahim. I'm the new manager of the Global Partnership for Social <laughs> Accountability and uh, also the global lead for citizen engagement um, at the World Bank. Um, and so, you know, there's a very rich discussion. I want to thank Vinay, and of course, Vinay and I have have had some great conversations about this. And, and as this report has evolved, uh, I think it's really pointing us in some new directions. And um, and and Carolyn, a lot of what you said also very much resonated. It'd be nice to talk again. It's been a long time. Um, and and so, you know, that rethink and stock take we're doing. I mean, we had a, a very powerful citizen engagement framework in 2014, which was pointing in directions we weren't going when Jim Kim said, you know, he wants 100% beneficiary feedback across projects. You know, it drove us towards an objective. Um, but then again, you're gonna see diminishing returns in a model like that, which then ultimately incentivizes staying at a certain level of, of meeting an indicator about elements in a project. Whereas this is about systemic institutional work that needs to happen, not about just making good projects with good consultation mechanisms or grievance redress mechanisms in that. And so the rethink we're doing is trying to surface some of that work. There's actually great work happening in many parts of the bank that are taking that systemic and institutional approach. But the current measurement system isn't built around that. So how do we take what's good about the current system and develop an, a, a new system. So at the same time, we're having um, the corporate uh, scorecard of the bank is reviewing all its commitment indicators. And we have that last cycle of reporting on the 2018 Independent Evaluation Group um, uh, report uh, on citizen engagement this year as part of the management action record that the bank does. So we'll be 
bringing up, uh, you know, a lot of this thinking. And um, I think a report like this is giving us a lot of food for thought. The architecture of the GPSA, the points are very well taken. Uh, I think they're true. But again, it's important not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. There is a lot the GPSA has done to open up a space that was completely closed uh, in the World Bank and in the, in the multilateral development space. And so what the GPSA can't do well is the transaction costs of managing small grants to CSOs. Small grants to governments are also very difficult for us to do. We know that from the trust fund architecture as well, and Dirk can probably speak volumes about that. So there is a system, I think Vinay has sort of thought about it, but that's sort of where we're leaning towards as we start to think about the future financial architecture we'd propose is a system of on landing. So we're not managing the individual grants to the CSOs, but we are managing overall fund envelope and the linkage to the bank systems and institutional reform in projects, which we haven't systematically done in citizen engagement or in the GPSA model, but have the illustrative examples. This is now about connecting the dots, which we have not done. And so that's where we're trying to lean the thinking. That's where we're trying to lean the rethink. It's going to be consultative. We're gonna have a lot of outreaches. We already have had sessions with the CSO working group on citizen engagement, the expert advisory group on citizen engagement. And so I think there's gonna to need to be a dialogue as we develop a strategic options paper. Um, Louise Cord, my global director on social sustainability inclusion, also has developed a new um, social sustainability paper. It's a great book that's come out that's sort of reframing this concept. It's due to be discussed by uh, vice presidents of the World Bank. I mean, it's been it's it's being uh, consulted, uh, and then it'll go to the board as well. And that has a new concept at at its core called process legitimacy, um, with great evidence and data looking at how programs and policies, effectiveness and development outcomes are very explicitly affected by the things we're talking about. So it's a new paradigm shift also on thinking about this concept that we're bringing into the, into the lexicon of the World Bank, how we measure it, how we collect data for it. Um, and also on the digital side of this, we haven't talked about this today, but we're also thinking about that, how feedback from citizens is really taken on uh, in a different manner and really use, it's like voices of the poor that Jim Wolfenson talked about, but thinking of that today is data, which we don't do. And that's going to be currency in the World Bank. And that's going to be currency for our clients. So we have also a lot of work in the traditional data analytics, but also using new AI ML models that allow us to take information about citizen perception and feedback and use that in correlation with other big data sources to think about how we direct and manage development programs. So we're really doing a, a, a rethink of this agenda. And, and you know, the views that Vinay is tabling are, are very valuable for us. And, and the PTF study is really informing how, how we're thinking about this too. So thank you to PTF uh, and OSF as well. And OSF has been a great partner to the GPSA from the beginning as well. Thanks. Uh, Carolyn uh, makes a point in, in, in the chat that uh, uh, Ida is quite a, a, often a leader of, of reform across the institution in, in places like disclosure and safeguards. And you know, maybe this is one more place where uh, Ida can push the rest of the bank to work. And there seems to be a lot of internal and external desire for that to happen. Um, Frank, to your particular comment on when the results <laughs> measurement comes out. Uh, uh, Deborah wrote it and said the um, IDA results measurement system was updated in October 2022. So they've moved to dumping it just before my birthday, which I think is appropriate. But anyway, um, <laughs> um, uh, I want to give uh, everybody on the panel um, uh, an opportunity to say last words. But uh, uh, do you want to, um, uh, to, to have a, a last round? Um, perhaps we go in the reverse order that we we started, if that's all right, Michael. Yeah. Um. It would be great to have a, a follow-up conversation on GPSA, perhaps when the evaluation is out and there's no shortage of things we could talk about, government approval of projects, just the limited number of them. A lot of it is resource-driven, um, much to unpack. Um, one point that hasn't come up, which I think is interesting in the PTF paper, is the suggestion of a percentage of project fund to go towards these mechanisms, like a 1%, which you want to find a level that doesn't feel so scary enough, but actually generates some meaningful resources to go to this work. But I think that's an interesting idea because if you fall back on the GPSA model of seeking donors who are particularly interested in this agenda and you convince them to put some money, it's never going to be sustainable. Um, so you, if you're going to create this infrastructure, at least create a financing model that makes it sustainable to keep it going alongside it. And um, and I didn't want my call for like some big new accountability fund to suggest that we shouldn't be pursuing these these 
amendments within IDA right now. Like I think you can work on multiple fronts. We're clever enough to do that. So, so I do applaud the specific suggestions in here, and I like the the idea of IDA as a space of experimentation. And I I should have been full disclosure that I worked in the bank ten years myself, so I I know some of these frustrations. So apparently we're all put compelled to come back to this conversation. Um, I'll stop there. Thanks, Charles. <laughs> Um, no, I can dovetail on that on a lighter note. Um, I look forward to my retirement because it seems to be incredibly uh, liberating. Um, but, <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Thank you. But um, well, seriously, I, I think there's a lot of agreement, right, on um, on the direction, on what we need to do, the importance of this agenda, um, the progress that's been made, yes, but Right, we need to do um, a lot more, and it was music to my ears, um, Ali, to hear you sort of um, conceptualize what what you're thinking about um, in that group. I think uh, Carolyn's point, also from my own operational experience, of the need to systematize this. I think this is true. I think it is still too much dependent on the individuals, etc. It's not for a lack of uh, goodwill. People are busy; they're delivering, um, right? But uh, and they need help as well, right? Not everybody's excellent at uh, engaging civil society. Uh, when you're an expert uh, engineer in uh, dam construction, uh, maybe that doesn't doesn't come um, natural to you immediately. I hope I'm not picking on any engineers in the room. Um, the, the third point I do want to make, um, though, is um, I, I would really caution against um, pushing hard on shifting either resources away from uh, the model um, that Ida has. I, I think that works. Um, it needs that other, that other leg. The way I would put this, you know, we talk about country systems. In my view, country systems is not just government. Country systems include civil society, right? In any country, accountability works with supply and demand. So I, I would involve or include uh, CSOs in, in country systems. But that said, I think the business model um, I think works, and it's a strength. Carolyn's point, I wish we were market movers, right? We, if you look at the numbers, um, with Busan and Accra and Paris, we're not. Everybody else is moving away from what we agreed we would do, which is to put the governments into the driver's seat and respect ownership, right? And it almost looks like they're vacating it at the expense of um, at well, because the bank is there, they can then afford to go somewhere else. I'm I'm very worried about that, right? So I think the architecture point is very important. So look look at the look at the 55 percent and beyond as a source um, of funding, and that's why I think the GPSA approach, a reformed, evolved GPSA approach, is really the right one. And last point, timing is good. We have this evolution. Uh, discussion. I'm deeply involved in it um, as well, and it allows us really to look under every stone at the moment, right? There's this, uh, these windows of opportunity sometimes in the history of institutions. This is one of them. So let's seize it. Thank you very much. I think this has been a very interesting debate, and I think compared to many years ago, indeed, the, the world has evolved and I actually used to work myself for the World Bank as a consultant in a country office where I was vi visiting uh, schools and, uh, and health clinics in very remote areas where World Bank staff did not go, but they supported us to, to do um, research on, on leakages and, and so on of funding. And this was actually collaboration with a local university and two international universities and a local CSO. So I do, I do absolutely agree with what has been said and a strong advocate for a stronger citizen engagement. Um, and I think what is, uh, what is uh, absolutely also agree with what Caroline has mentioned, that there need to be incentives to promote it um, within the bank and also in HR systems. And there's a strong, if there's a strong willingness of the country director, much can be done. But this, this of course, needs to be systematized, uh, not only into the HR systems, but in the wider World Bank approach. Um, and I think also in terms of, of having an, an Ida Vinay yes or no, there are pros and cons. As Vinay also mentioned, you need to have some independence. So being funded from an Ida window or, or being funded from Ida or IDP or D per se would then not 
uh, set up the right mechanisms uh, and incentives. So I think it needs to be thought through. Um, I'm very new to the GPSA, so I'm very much looking forward to the evaluation. I don't know what the what the issues are with the fund. Um, I think the purpose of the fund is, is very beautiful and, and uh, serves uh, the right purpose. Um, in terms of, of what is the bank, where is the bank already moving in the right direction in terms of strengthening country systems, but also local institutions and local governments and local engagements is, is in, in projects in very difficult FCV countries that we now see coming to the board these weeks. Uh, where there is a, a strong decentralized component uh, in collaboration with local um, organizations and where the bank has, and, and I, I speak to the uh, compliments to, to management, is trying to really convince the, the central governments in, in channeling funds through and, uh, and making sure that funds arrive at the local levels and to create ownership at, at the local level. Uh, so I think that's also a way of, of strengthening um, this uh, engagement mechanism and accountability mechanisms. On the digital side, absolutely, I think we need to need to grasp all opportunities. I think my own little city in Belgium uh, recently won a prize from the European Commission because they've set up a, a civil society engagement fund during six weeks. They engaged 2,000 organizations to try to set up a, a, a city improvement plan and particularly on greening the city. So I think it's, it's a nice example, but that we're, we're we definitely have to take that opportunity uh, in, in, uh, in, let's say, not only in, in, uh, in Africa and in other countries, but also for ourselves in our own countries, we need to look at this opportunity. And, um, and, and lastly, I just want to also thank the, uh, the audience because there are a lot of board colleagues listening in. So it's also nice to see that, uh, that there is um, a good participation uh, from that side. Thank you very much. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to thank everyone uh, for uh, uh, their comments and contributions. Uh, and uh, I would like to reiterate the point which has been made that uh, by Dirk also and others that there is a lot of agreement on the directions. I think I would just close my remarks with uh, commenting on uh, uh, two things. Uh, one is that um, uh, people uh, said that uh, focus on the existing mechanisms. And I think the report uh, agrees with that, that uh, the important thing is the objectives and uh, a fit for purpose mechanism, which can be done under existing arrangements. Uh, when talking about existing arrangements, the report highlights that we reviewed more than 10 civil society funding windows hosted by the World Bank. GPSA is only one of them. So there is a lot to learn from looking at uh, including the global partnership uh, for education, civil society window, including the civil society window in climate uh, investment fund, including the civil society window in global environment fund, which has operated by UNDP in a decentralized country model for more than 30 years and has funded hundreds of thousands of CSOs. So there is a lot to learn. Uh, and that's why the report recommends uh, that uh, once uh, the idea is, uh, is, uh, has found general acceptance, it should move to a feasibility study proper, which should look at the issue of incentives and others. I think the last uh, point uh, is uh, the, the, uh, the people have questioned whether the World Bank is fit for purpose. And that's a very legitimate question. But as I said, the World Bank is already in this business. Uh, whether it is fit for the purpose or not is instant to be determined. But it is; it has more than 10 civil society funding operations uh, going on. So, and they're in different uh, ways. Uh, so, and I think it is fair point to say the, the World Bank was set up for the governments, but it did find a way to create GPSA for civil society and the unanimous approval of the board. It did find a way to create an IFC. It did find a way to create MIGA without government uh, directly dealing with it. So that brings me to the last point and emphasize again what Dirk and Natalie have said, uh, that timing is now right to make bold transformational moves. The evolution roadmap is there. Leave no stone unturned, somebody said. Please turn this stone of civil society engagement. Thank you very much. 
Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, thank you for those of you online. Indeed, this is a, a, an impressive group. Uh, one or two of you came in with comments right at the last minute, which I will pass on rather than uh, read out, but uh, in the interest of time. Uh, thank you for those of you in the room. As I say, I, I believe there's lunch somewhere around uh, um, and uh, look forward to a continuing discussion. Thank you.